Do you enjoy sweet things such as chocolate? Mm, maybe you prefer to indulge in more salty snacks. How about the amazing umami feeling you get when you eat seafood? But have you ever stopped and wondered, why do these things taste the way they do? Well, we can thank a certain little mechanism called taste receptors. Sweet, a taste that you get when you consume foods that are high in sugar. Salty, uh, this one's pretty simple. You eat something with salt in it. Umami, that savory taste you get when you consume certain seafoods. Most foods that have the umami taste have L-glutamate in them. Bitter, a less desirable taste that you come to love. An example can be coffee. Sour, another tricky taste that you get when exposing your tongue to positive H ions. A common example can be highly citric fruits such as lemons. These are categorized as the five main tastes. But did you know, there's a hidden sixth taste? Well, there is, and it's called the kokumi sensation. The term became popular in Japan, thus giving it the name kokumi, which means rich taste in Japanese. This is triggered through the calcium taste receptors on our tongue. Interestingly enough, the kokumi sensation does not actually elicit a taste. This is why many do not consider this as a taste. However, studies do indicate that the kokumi taste shares similar receptors with the sweet and umami taste. Now let's get into taste buds and taste receptors. Taste buds are the primary sensory unit for taste. We have thousands of taste buds in the papilla found on the tongue epithelium. The papilla are the small raised bumps we can see when we look at our tongue. Each of these taste buds contain 50 to 100 taste receptor cells, which sensor different tastes. These taste receptor cells are bundled like little bananas to form the taste bud. These taste receptor cells are categorized into three types to transmit the information for each of our main tastes. Type 1 transmits information on saltiness through the use of glio-like cells and sodium ion channels. Type 2 transmits sweet, umami, bitter, and kokumi and involves a G-protein coupled receptor pathway or GPCR. Type 3 includes the sour pathway which involves selective proton channels. For this video, we will focus on the type 2 taste receptor cells since they represent the majority of our taste being sweet, umami, bitter, and kokumi and they also follow a common GPCR pathway. Now let's discuss how these taste receptors actually send a message to our brain. As mentioned, sweet, umami, bitter, and kokumi all follow a common GPCR pathway. Because they use GPCRs, they are associated with a heterotrimeric G protein, which means it has three parts. These three parts include the alpha, beta, and gamma subunits. When we eat foods with these tastes, the taste molecule is able to bind and activate this receptor. Activation of the receptor allows these G protein subunits to dissociate and trigger a signal signaling cascade of second messengers. In this case, it is the beta and the gamma subunits that elicit this important response. The beta and gamma subunits are able to activate phospholipase C-beta-2, which leads to the hydrolysis of PIP2 to form DAG and IP3. IP3 is important here as it is able to activate specific IP3 receptors on the endoplasmic reticulum. The IP3 receptor is also an ion channel that allows the release of calcium ions that have been stored in the endoplasmic endoplasmic reticulum. This release of calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum increases the overall intracellular calcium concentration. This greater calcium concentration is then able to activate the sodium selective channels also known as transient receptor potential cation channel subfamily M member 4 and 5 or TRPM4 and 5. These sodium selective channels allow sodium ions to enter the cell. Since sodium and calcium both have positive charges, having more of these ions inside the cell makes the charge of the cell more positive. This is also called depolarization. Once the charge of the cell reaches a certain threshold, it is able to initiate an action potential. This thereby activates the panixin channels, which releases the neurotransmitter ATP. ATP is then able to activate a perigenic receptors on the efferent cranial nerve to transmit the signal to the gustatory cortex in the brain. The gustatory cortex is in the cerebral cortex which does the processing of taste information to allow us to perceive the tastes and flavors. The gustatory cortex integrates information on taste, texture, and temperature and also integrates information from the olfactory cortex which incorporates our sense of smell. Together, this information helps us decide whether the food we are eating is nutritious and should be ingested or if it is something harmful that we should reject. Depending on the response, this may elicit salivation for digestion or trigger nausea and vomiting.
Our ability to detect harmful foods and toxins has been selected for throughout our evolution. As an example, over the years, humans have developed more sensitive bitter receptors, as bitter tastes have often been associated with harmful toxins. The increased sensitivity has aided in our species survival as it has allowed us to become better at detecting harmful substances and avoiding ingestion. Now you would be wondering why some people have different tastes for vegetables, for example broccoli and cilantro. You see, some people would have a bitter taste for broccoli while others will find it normal and some people would taste soap for cilantro and others would not. Well, the primary cause of this is genetics, in which is there's a reason why bitter sensitivity might have been an evolutionary component. There is a compound in broccoli that not everyone can taste, but it makes it bitter. It varies between populations on how many can taste the bitterness of broccoli. For example, in England, the non-taster is about 31.5%, but for Native Americans, it's 98%. On average, about 70% of us can taste something bitter in broccoli, but those with two copies of the bitter sensitivity gene are closer to 20%, and they are much more likely to hate it. Some people with the variations in the TAS2R38 gene can taste this vegetable as bitter and horrible, and those with different variations don't. Everyone inherits two copies of a taste gene called TAS2R38. The particular variants you are born with determine if you are sensitive to bitter tastes from certain chemicals such as glucosinolates, which are commonly found in cruciferous vegetables like brussels sprouts, cabbage, or even broccoli. People who inherit two copies of a variant called AVI aren't sensitive to bitter tastes. Those born with one copy of AVI and one copy of another variant called PAV perceive the bitter tastes of these chemicals, but aren't necessarily overwhelmed by them. However, people with two copies of PAV, often called super tasters, find the same foods exceptionally bitter. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more great content.